Um, today, we're going to be looking at some um, strategies for nature journaling. And um, there is a, a special request for taking a really close look at a bird with a complex pattern on it. Um, the woodcock is a really cool bird. And I want to take a look at doing um, an illustration of this and how you can build really complex patterns uh, into a subject using colored pencils. So um, I'll give everybody a moment right now to, if you have a set of colored pencils, you might want to stand up and go get those right now. I'm going to go get mine and I'll be right back. <laughs> So the woodcock, or timber doodle, as it's also called, the timber doodle. Today, we're going to play with the timber doodle. Now, that's a cool name. Um, so uh, we're gonna, uh, I'm going to take a look at, at the American woodcock, because it's the kind of woodcock which we have in the United States. Um, it's this really, really weird <laughs> looking bird. And um, it's, it's got this it does these, these great little displays. It kind of goes meow, meow, and it will sit there and it'll kind of go around in a circle like this going meow, meow, and it'll be out in the middle of the forest, meow, meow, and it has, it spends most of its time with its beak probing around down in the soil, so it has this crazy long beak. And if you think about it, if you were to take, say, chopsticks and stick them into the soil and then try to open them, because of the pressure down here, it would take an enormous amount of pressure at this end to open them up even a little. So how is it that you can stick your beak into the soil and get things? Well, first of all, along that beak, there are all sorts of very fine sensors. So the tip of the bill, don't think of it as like, you know, hard fingernail thing. On the woodcock's bill, the tip of it is really, really sensitive. And it can also, um, the tip of the bill, it'll stick this thing in straight, and then the tip of it can go like this, right? So it sticks in there, and then the tip of it goes, right, and grabs a worm and pulls it out. So it doesn't have to go like this. It doesn't have to go like that. It can stick it in straight, and just the tip of it can go like, I'm going to get that, right? And then it pulls this whole thing out. So the tip of the bill can go, not just the whole thing, like, isn't that cool? Um, and another kind of crazy things like why, why woodcocks are, are ridiculously cool is that the woodcocks, now on, on me, my eyes are set up like the other primates with my eyes forward. So my field of view is in this cone going out in front of me. And so it's, it's easy to sneak up on me unless I'm looking at myself on my computer screen and I can see what's behind me, All right? Um, so, um, birds can handle this in two ways. One is, they will, if you see birds kind of going around, you'll see some birds with forward-facing eyes kind of going around talking on their phone. They're actually using the camera to look behind them so you can't sneak up on them. So that's what the birds are doing when they're doing this on their phone. The other way to do it is you put your eyes on the side and now you have more front and back vision. So you'll see on a lot of you know, herbivores and things, you know, people will say eyes on the side likes to hide, eyes in front likes to hunt. <clears throat> Um, so predators tend to be doing this, owls, right? And then the more that the eyes are on the side, um, then we're talking about you know, sparrows and things like that that are you know, pecking, 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 and they want to kind of look out for who the bad guys are. Now, if you're a woodcock, you're spending all this time with your head down here like this, right? So you're doing this into the dirt all the time. Their eyes are closer to the back of the head than they are to the front. So they actually have more of a cone of 3D vision behind them than in front. And that's just cool. That's just, that's just really cool. So these are neat birds. But, and then they just, you're going to throw in all this camouflage. And 
we're going to learn how to take one of these things. We're going to do a drawing of it at a three quarter view. And um, we're going to also look at how we put the details and, and patterns in it. So this is a good chance for us to look at um, the um, you're, you're going to have a chance to um, to look at how you get um, both kind of block in the structure and shape of this. And we're going to look at some of the fine, fine details. In this workshop, um, the, we're going to be looking at the more you might take as a scientific illustrator instead of, oh, look, there's a woodcock out there, make quick sketch, make quick sketch, sort of generalize those patterns. We're going to be kind of looking at kind of a, a, a slower, more careful, fussy drawing. When scientific illustrators are doing these sorts of drawings, they will be looking at photo reference. They will also have all their sketches and notebooks out in front of them. They will um, often have parts of birds or full skins of birds, what scientists call study skins, in front of them so they can see feather by feather by feather. So if you look at a field guide and you just kind of like, wow, it's amazing that you got all that detail in there. Yeah, that's because we get to have, we're sitting there in our studio and we've got the photograph there. We've got the dead bird sitting right there. I don't have a dead woodcock in my house. Or, and the live one is, I, I, it's just running around too fast for me to catch. So I'm not gonna be putting it on the screen here. And um, the, what? Yeah, you just, but, but every once in a while you might hear it. Um, the, uh, so the, don't feel that you're supposed to somehow in a field sketch get this level of detail in your drawings, right? Um, and part of, I think, what, what helps me is to kind of realize like what is practical in the field and what can you, um, and, and what can you do um, more in the, in the studio. And, and you, you don't want to kind of get like, just look at some people's drawings, it's like, that's so incredibly detailed. There is one person, however, um, uh, Keith Brokey. I'm gonna just bring over, I'm gonna start just by sort of showing you a Keith Brokey book. And um, you'll see like this person has a ridiculous level of detail in their field studies. And what Keith does is he'll find cooperative birds and he'll sit there and put a telescope on them and the bird will sit there. And on really cooperative birds through the telescope, Keith gets all this crazy detail. But I just want to show you another cool bird artist uh, because this, this little, this Scotsman has got it, got it going on. Let's see here. Uh, where's a Keith book? Here's one. Where's another? Show me the book looks. Aha. So we're going to start with this as part of our discussion of, oh, and by the way, folks, at um, 105 or so, I'm going to have to cut off and jump off of our, our call. So often we've been, um, I try to finish the class in one hour, and then we've been doing like an hour of kind of community connection. Um, um, Avea and Brian, if either of you are available to hang out for community sharing, that would be wonderful, but I'm, I'm not going to be able to be there. Are either of you up for that? Perhaps? All right, we'll see. Yeah, this be fun. Uh, okay, now here we go. Let me do a share. All right, I'll check this out. Um, so who is this? Uh, just wanted to show you people this this is this is another just sort of inspiring inspiring artist um this uh keith brokey here who is who is keith there's keith all right and <laughs> so doesn't need a dead bird but this is a cooperative subject right that's a very cooperative subject um and so what you'll see in, in Keith's sketches is just this, this is gouache on dark toned paper. Oh, just this really um, intense level of detail. 
So these are graphite pencils, and then this one has watercolor on top of that graphite pencil drawing. This is gouache on toned paper. Mm. And as we've been talking about with gouache, the idea of letting some of the color of the paper show through. Look how here, even in the belly of this razor bill here, you can see that little bit of a brown wash in there. Um, oh, there you go. There you are, little razor bill. Um, that brown in there is just, that's some of the color of the paper that's showing through, I'm giving it that, that warmth. Um, but towards the back of this, um, let's see, yeah, there we are. That's not what I want. I don't want you. I want you to go into it. Here we go. Um, so yeah, you'll see some of these drawings that, that Keith does super detailed. And so this would be a place where Keith is sitting down with a spotting scope and looking at this, this bird that is on a nest. So it's sitting there. And so it'll be, it'll be out there for the long term. But for most often when you are are, are sketching in the field, you'll get kind of just a quick glimpse of something and you kind of, you can get more, more quick shapes. This, these are fun, fun books to, to look through. Yeah, even on, on, on Brocky's um, field sketches, um, I'm just always amazed by the level of, of, of detail that comes in those. My, my field sketches are much more loose than this. Um, but so that's, a, that's an inspiring, that's an inspiring uh, illustrator. This book is One Man's Island. This book here is One Man's River. Uh, One Man's River has more, um, some more loose watercolors in it. And here, there are some field studies by this character. Right. Reeb Chick. But notice somebody even like this this Keith Brokey fellow, when starting a sketch, there are these light, loose, pale sketches that are blocking in the general basic shape. Quickly try to capture that pose. Inspiring. That's one man's river. Um, out of focus um, by Keith Brophy. So now let's go for one person's woodcock here. Um, they're lovely little birds. I'm going to do a Google search for um, no, new window. Um, American for an American woodcock, and I'm going to do a little image search. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and just sort of show you how I go about doing a kind of a, a, a search for for resources on the web. Um, when you're using pictures from the web, we want to avoid copying line for line one person's photograph unless you get their permission to do it. Um, anything you do, by the way, for your own work, um, your, own, um, your own enjoyment, your own learning, you can use anything any way you want. But if you're gonna be turning around and selling that picture to somebody, then, then it's a good idea um, to get the permission of the photographer because this is something that they worked to do. They got out there and they, they, they shared it with folks. So here's, these are timber doodles. Look at how 
far that eye is back on the head. And I am going to look for a photograph that is going to show me, I want a photograph that is going to generally show the structure of the body. Aren't they just an odd looking thing? I mean, what up with you? That's crazy. And look at this camouflage pattern on the back. Oh, wow. There's a little display. Now that's neat. Oh, that's so much fun. So these are just, they're, they're, they're wonderful little beep. Oh, hey, there's my bird again. Um, um, here, I'm, what I'm looking for, oh, here, this is cool. Um, so this one is vocalizing. And look at this, if you look, um, so it's in a flashlight beam, it's vocalizing at night. So they've got a big spotlight on it. That's why you see that crisp shadow over there. And its eye looks blood red because it is um, reflecting the spotlight back. So this is when it's doing that um, um, little vocalization. And you notice how the upper beak here is not straight, it's tipping up at the end. We talked about how they stick that beak into the mud and the top, the tip can flip up. You see a little wrinkle right there. That is its tongue uh, laying in that lower beak. That's just, I mean, it's such a cool little critter. Um, so I want to um, get, find a reference photograph here that is going to show me an interesting three quarter view. Um, or a cool posture. You can either get something where it's a display posture, like me, right? There you see display posture also. See photograph taken at night. See that shadow that is behind it? And the red glow in the eye. So that's a, that's a big flash bulb just went off on that little woodcock. Um, this is fun. This one is uh, displaying to its reflection. Um, but I'm looking for kind of a neat three quarter view picture. I want to decide what of these angles do I want to show? That's kind of close to what I want. I want something that sort of shows this weird, how far back the eye is. And yeah, maybe. All right, so I am, it's not quite the angle that I want on the head here. I'd rather, this is more of a side view of the head, but this is a neat little kind of erect view uh, of the body. So I'm going to keep that as a possibility. You can, mix and match between several different photographs. So you could, for instance, take um, the head of one bird from one photograph. See that upper beak looks like it's bent right there? Because it is. Um, Let's see here. <clears throat> I want a head turned slightly toward the viewer. Yeah, kind of like that. All right, this one is more of a blurry photograph, but it's got a head position that I like. So I'll often kind of get several photographs queued up if I'm using photograph references. And then I will bounce around between several of those drawings. Um, and then that helps me not just be copying one person's photograph, but also helps me just 
look around more. Now that's a cool photograph. Oh, I like that. I like this head position. All right. Um, and I'm going to get one more photograph. Um, I'd like to get a woodcock pointing to the left and then I will splice these critters together. I'll show you how I do that. You not quite what I want. Are you what I want? Yeah, I think you just might be. Yeah, I think I've got enough stuff now. This, see, this one's um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a body like this one and I'm going to splice it into this one's head. So I want, I like this slightly turned towards you head angle a little bit better. Um, now I am going to try to do what Melinda Nakagawa taught me to do, uh, which is just to um, I'm going to try to stop share here. I'm going to set up my uh, screen so that you can see both. Um, I'm going to set up my screen so that you can see both the photographs that I'm looking at, as well as the drawing that I'm doing. And We'll block this in, and then we'll take a few parts of the details of the feathers and look at how we would how we would do those. And I am going to share my screen. Here is a, here's an American woodcock. Really cool little bird. I'm going to hide floating meeting controls. And I want to make a sketch of it right over here. A good general idea before you start drawing anything is just to start with a few light, loose sketches. So, I'm going to make a little quick sketch over here. Here's a ball of a head, and it has a beak that comes down. There is a back, and a belly, and my beak is going to be ending somewhere in around here. Um, looking at angles, there's a neat angle here coming up the beak and onto the forehead, um, then turns flat. And then there's just a big smooth line going down the back. What about underneath the beak? Um, belly is coming out here. And it's going to come down. The eye 
I'm expecting the eye to be somewhere in here, but it's not. My eye is going to be way back here. So take a look at the distance from, um, if you drew a line between the front of the head and the back of the head, where along that line is the eye going to be? So somewhere in this area. And then I'm going to look at kind of coming down um, from here. Is that a reasonable distance? Yeah, so somewhere in there. So this bird's eye is going to be somewhere back here. When you're making a careful drawing of a critter, um, it helps often to just get the face, the expression, this area right in here, get that part of your bird working um, before getting on to the rest of the feathers and the details of the bird. If I can do that, um, then, the, and the bird is looking back at me, that's going to really help me be able to draw it. One other thing that I'm going to do, kind of a critical part of this drawing here, is going to be right in here where this beak comes into the face. And what I want to think about is the beak coming into the face in a zone in here so that I then have a little bit of a seam kind of coming up in the middle of the forehead. If I draw, what I don't want to do is to have this beak coming into the side of the head like that. I want the beak to be starting on the face of the bird and then a little bit of a ridge line go, showing going up the middle of that forehead. That's going to be very helpful for my bird. On a bird with a long beak, your brain is going to want to make it way too long. So be wary on something like this of overdoing the bill length. So um, if I look at the length of the head here, I'm going to go one head length down here and about two head lengths. Right? So this length of the head, if I use it as a unit of measurement, I'm going down about one head length. And it's actually a little bit less than two. So if that's a head length, I'm going to go down about one uh, head length to about here. And then two head lengths would be there, so a little bit less than that. So the tip of my bill will be somewhere in there. Then I look at it and say, like, did I make it too big? It's a big tendency to make our beaks too big. So I'm going to take another look again. Yeah, yeah that, that could work. That could work. So I'm going to want a line that comes down. I'm going to want a line that comes down. I'm going to want a line that on the head here, when I'm in, uh, getting into drawing this head, the way, well, let, uh, actually, let, let me block that in once I get this, the rest of this drawing going. I'm going to move this little kind of starter woodcock over here. And I'm just going to play with these shapes a little bit more here. So I'm going to have a head approximately this big. I'm making these lines very, very pale. So on this, I did them a little bit more bold because I didn't mind if they showed up in my final drawing. Here now that I'm really going to be drawing my, my more of my final woodcock, I, I want to have these guidelines just be a little bit um, smaller. So notice this angle across the back here. There's a flat line here almost parallel with the top of the screen. And then the back comes down. Your head is in there. And your beak is coming out here. The body down there. Now, for blocking in this head, I am going to frame it up 
as a geometric shape. I'm going to frame it up as a geometric shape. So I'm going to just do a little diagram over here of how I want to think of this Woodcock's head. Looking at the, the, the picture there, there is a, um, the forehead comes up as a little bit of an angle. <clears throat> There's the front of the face. There's a line in here where my beak is going to be attaching. And that continues up here. On the back of the head, that's here. And the side of the head it's coming down. And that eye is sitting somewhere up in here. So I want to think of an edge here. If you look here, so right along here, I think I'm sort of envisioning kind of, if I were to carve this, I would have a flat surface here, right? There's a flat surface that is up in here. An angled piece here. So I'm thinking, what are the planes of this head? Maybe we're coming out here. And our back is going to tuck into that. So if in my head, as I'm starting to draw this, if this form down here starts to feel more three-dimensional because I'm kind of making this carved cubed shape out here, um, that's going to be that's going to be really helpful. That's really going to be helpful for me as I start to sculpt this thing. So let me just look at a few more angles. There's a angle here. There's an angle in here. There's a flat top to the head. And then that's going to continue out on the back there. The eye is going to be somewhere in this area. And The back of my head here, the top of my head here, the front of my head is in here. The center of that face is in there. So that big broad bill it's going to be coming out of here. Has a nostril in there. Now I'm going to place a few of the lines and marks that are on this face. There should be a line that drops down from the eye. There's a line that comes back from the eye. There is a, um, on the back of the head, I'm seeing one white line, two white line, three white line. So there's one white line, two white line, three white lines kind of coming back in here. A little bit of an ear patch in here. And this line is going to come on there. So I've lightly got this blocked in. Now I want to start thinking about as I kind of get in here and really start my drawing, 
what pencils am I going to be use, using? I find that if I do a lot with a graphite pencil on, and the, the pencil drawing is going to ultimately be sort of mostly a pencil drawing, if I do a lot with a graphite pencil, um, it tends to really smear a lot when I'm putting my other pencils on it. So it's so much softer that it will get kind of picked up and smeared. So I'm going to try to do my drawing here with a pencil that will be uh, sort of stay put a little bit more. A um, couple of ways that I might do this. Um, one is um, if you like drawing with a black grape pencil, sometimes I'll do it with a Prismacolor black grape pencil and draw my thing in with that. Another great um, pencil for starting a um, to sort of blocking in a sketch is a dark brown pencil. Sort of, so you look at your pencil set and you kind of like, what do I have some sort of pencil that's sort of a sepia dark brown? All right, I've got this one here. Uh, there's my black pencil. I'm going to use this, this walnut brown pencil and I'm going to make it just a little bit sharper than this. If when you start to draw with your, your pencils, if you find you start to draw and the tip breaks, a good strategy is right after you sharpen your pencils, just to spin the tip of it a little bit like that. It's not as big a problem with the polychromos pencils as it is with some of the Prismacolor pencils, but that just helps you kind of get a sh little bit of a sharper point. And that uh, what, what you don't want is any little micro step offs in the tip of your pencil, you'll then um, have have removed those. So now I'm going to draw over this with this pencil and I'll just drop down, zoom down. And it's not working. So I will actually wait a minute. I think I know what to do. Um, can I come here and zoom and use this? Oh, yeah, there we go. Right. <clears throat> so here's the little head of my bird. And I'm going to darken this line, come up here. And I'm going to let my line in some places be lighter, some places be darker. Um, I might even have a little bit too much going on with my blue pencil in here. So I'm going to lighten some of this. Some of those guidelines that I was initially putting in, now that I'm getting into that area, I am going to, so there's a little kind of lighter line, come around here to the back of my head. Um, right here where the beak comes in, I want this to show that you are coming up. and fading out. If you find, if you find that when you are, um, when you are drawing, uh, let's see. Oh, I'm on manual focus. Um, if you find that when you are drawing, your, the tip of your pencil starts to become dull. Uh, one trick that you can do is every once in a while you'll see me, I'm just going to rotate the tip of my pencil. So as one surface that I'm drawing with starts to get dull, I just give it a little bit of a, rotate, a rotation and then I'm on to a flatter surface. So here I am coming down. And the feathers in the front of the face here are going to swing in here like this. And I'm going to give them just a few little kind of flicks in like this. So what I'm doing is I'm making marks where 
I'm pressing with my pencil and then flicking up. And that gives me this darker mark that um, kind of can su suggest a, 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 a fluffy edge. Pay attention to the shapes that you get right where the beak comes into the bill. So here I'm getting this little M shape. The corner of the mouth here, I'm gonna press a little bit more forcefully with my pencil to make a darker mark and then flick out. And here is the lower bell. The nostril is not where I put it in my original sketch. It's closer in here. Let's go put, drop in the eye. You notice my pencil is still sharp. That's just because I just gave it a little bit of a spin. And this eye has a little bit of a bump down here in this corner. So pay attention to the shape of that eye. Is it round or not? There's going to be a highlight zone up in here. So I just put a pale box where my highlight is going to be. and where my pupil is going to be. It's a bright white edge around the eye. A little bit of just sort of sculpting and molding around birds' eyes really helps the eye sit into the face. So then in here I have this dark line that is coming down. And I notice as it gets towards the beak here, there are little lines, so it seems to be broken out into little lines. Just twisted my pencil again, and now I've got sharp lines once again. So I've got coming down here in just a moment, my pencil, I'll sort of show you my pencil, how thick my pencil lead is. Yep, so after drawing like this, my pencil is making marks that are this thick, hold on, like this. And watch what happens when I spin this with my fingers. See that? So as I'm working, I'll regularly just spin that pencil with my fingers to... People, when they look at your drawing, they're gonna look right at that eye first thing. So a little bit of time sculpting that makes a big difference. On the back of the head here, um, I'm going to get rid of some of my blue pencil marks. You'll find that if you brush it with your hand, you will often smear your pencil. And you're like, ah, oh, so just be careful with, with, with doing that. Um, a few ways of, of handling that. I've got a post-it note here. I can come here and just pick up some of those little pieces. The post-it note will have enough adhesive to be able to pick up any little pieces of those or, or eraser things. All right, now let's put in that little band around the back of the head.
I want a consistently inconsistent line. So sometimes it's zigging forward and sometimes it's zagging back. And that line is going to come up like that. There's now another white little line in there. And the third little line kind of comes out in here. And below that, I have a dark mark that forks. Now I'm going to erase some of these marks here. So I'm looking at the distance between the bottom of the eye here and where this starts. So down in here, this edge is going to start in this height and then it's going to come up and continue here. Consistently inconsistent. Last thing I'm going to do here is just drop in there and remove a few of those other blue lines. Now let's add some color to this. So you see what I've done is I've done my drawing with this brown pencil, and that's going to give me some good sort of initial dark values. Those browns will play well with others. Um, what about on the belly here? Oh, let's do this here. Now, I want to mold and, and sculpt this bird. Um, here, because it's taken probably, the picture's probably taken with a flash bulb, there aren't really good shadows on this bird. Um, actually, let me see about, yeah. I, I had planned to show you how to splice this in with the other picture, but <laughs> I'm not going to because we just have a couple minutes left. But I do want to show how I would start to play with building up colors, layers of colored pencils to, 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 to match these, the, the colors that I'm seeing. Looking, I'm going to start with the, the head there. And I've got actually a, a lot of different colored pencils. I've got bunches of grays and 
some colors that I find are often really useful um, are some of just the really light gray pencils. For instance, on this bird's forehead, I'm going to sharpen this pencil. Having your pencils be sharp helps. Um, there is a buffy bar that comes down above the eye, and it's gray above that. So what I'm going to do is I am going to put this gray in, and what I'm going to do as I go is I'm going to, in this case, I want this to be a smooth coat. When I want it to be smooth, watch my pencil motion. What I'm doing is I am making little circles, little tiny circles. With light pressure, And I can build those up to get darker and darker values. There we are. There's that buffy face down below. I can look at my pencils, see if they have a pencil that, that matches that value. Um, it's nice. All right, so here, this is Prismacolor's sand pencil. And I'm going to come in and lightly Bring this in. Remembering there's that white edge around the eye, and I don't touch that. Hey, Jack, just so that you have a time check, uh, it is one o'clock now, and we want to make sure that we're respectful of your time. Oh, thank you so much. All right, I will, I've got a few more minutes. And what I want to do here is to just start building pencil on top of pencil on top of pencil. Let's try this. This is my dark yellow chrome pencil. Oh, that's pretty bright. But I'll bet with a light, this is a nice um, polychromos pencil here. I'm using my little swirls to get my smooth. Oh, that's coming in nice. You see where there's this little disjunct here where we're in this? So I'm going to bring this pencil in over this, put pencil over pencil so that there's no little white boundary there. I'm going to try this other Prismacolor pencil. Slightly darken this gray on the forehead. As long as I don't press too hard at any one point, I'll be able to build up my colors into richer and darker layers. Um, up there on the top of the head here, I am going to use a combination of my black pencil and my brown pencil. So two really dark pencils, a black and a brown. I think we had a question about what shade of gray to use for the Prismacolor. 
Um, so the, I'll tell you one that I first grabbed. I grabbed um, warm gray, very light number 964. But let's say I didn't have that and I just had a set of polychromos pencils. Here I've got my polychromos pencil warm gray, right? They don't have it. You know, you just go with a lighter coat, a lighter coat. And you can build that into a darker coat. I tend to like the texture of polychromos a little bit better than Prismacolor. I'm bringing some black into that. And I want that edge with the white to be really nice and crisp. If I put dark into it, I'm not going to be able to erase that out to a nice white. Another thing that I can do in a black area like that is I can pick any of my dark pencils and I can just put, here's a dark blue, I'm going to put a little bit of dark blue into this. along with the dark brown. And that just makes those, those shadow areas richer. I'm going to build up those colors. Well, not the shadow areas, um, those dark value zones. Jack, so you know, it's 105 now. Ah. I know. It I still <laughs> have a couple of seconds. I still have a couple of seconds. Um, now, watch this very kind of this, this very end piece. Now, uh, this is what I would, what I'd normally do is I would then come, I'm going to work through my entire piece the same way. First framing it out with my brown and then dropping these colors into it. But at the very end, let's say I'm all done with that. At the very end, I'm going to come back and I am going to use sharp pencils. So listen to the pencil sharpening in the background. Ooh, there's one. There's two. I'm going to get my little sharp pencils. And I'm going to come in and just crisp up the detail. on the edges of the bird like this. So look at this, see this muddy edge right there? And then look back at the other bird. Oh, crisp edge, muddy edge, crisp edge, muddy edge. Ah, all right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come from the dark. Bring that dark out just a little bit into there. And what about at that back end of it? Just really kind of get, I want to think of crisping up those edges. What about in here? I'm going to come a little bit of texture perhaps in here. A little bit of detail. And And then you get these, you can get these very sharp, precise details in your, in your drawing, but you're getting all those kind of where things really kind of crisp in 
right at the edge, right at the end. And that is um, a very useful way of, of kind of, of, of working those details. If there is, I'll do one last little piece here. Um, look here on the shoulder, the scapulars in here. Um, there's a background color with a darker color on top of it. In this case, what you would do is you would first put in that background value And then on top of that, because there's, it's just sharp darks against lights, you would put your darks. So very much like you would do with a watercolor approach. With a watercolor, you work from light to dark. With this, I'm going to do the same thing. So these dark, vermiculation details, meaning worm-like wiggly feathers, I'm going to put those in after I've established that kind of general tone base coat. If instead I now try to put something else in between those, it tends to just soften and blur and muddy the edges and you're not going to be able to get kind of crisp details. So <clears throat> there's a little bit of looking at the woodcock and um, I hope that there are strategies that you can see here that you can apply to other drawings that you do. And I'm going to turn off my visualizer so that it's no longer kind of a lag. Um, but but this is this is the 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 approach. You can get colored pencils are great. You can get nice crisp detail. You can um, get broad areas of tone. First, I would put in those areas of tone and then come in at the end, and you're going to work your dark little details over that structure. Big ideas, take your time, put in a light layer, then put another light layer on top of that, and modify that. As long as you don't press too hard right at the start, you're still going to be able to layer other colored pencils on top of what you have. But if you at the beginning get in there and you press really hard, you're going to put down a waxy layer of pencil across the paper, and you're then not going to be able to drop other colors in on top of that. I hope that this was useful and I hope you had fun. I'm going to have to bounce to another call. I'm actually uh, going to be uh, in four minutes. I'm joining my old high school um, and teaching them a nature journaling class. Um, they're doing a, a study on a, a project on studying uh, natural history of California and they wanted to, to do nature journaling. So I'm going to meet with my uh, students from my old high school and um, uh, do a little nature journaling workshop with them. But I hope that this was fun and that you got some useful strategies out of it. Um, looking forward to seeing everybody's work. I want to encourage people to, uh, to, to join a conversation here and share with each other, um, uh, share with each other any nature journaling that you've done or sketches of, of, uh, of uh, cocky woodcocks. Um, timber doodles. So um, thank you all very much. And Ray Bonto, great suggestion. Um, the timber doodle brought us into an investigation of some interesting and useful aspects of uh, drafting and drawing. You also sort of see that in Ill when I'm doing an illustration, I'm kind of going like, eh. Eh. right? It's a different speed. It's a different speed. And um, I would have a real challenge doing that, um, doing that out in the field when the mosquitoes are biting and my fingers are getting numb. Take care, everybody. Have fun.